Welcome. We're going to be getting into Lesson 1, Part 3 of the Bible. And we're going to be looking at the rules for interpreting the Bible. Actually, the Bible interprets itself, and we're going to see the rules for actually getting the correct information we need out of the Bible, especially when it comes to the plan of salvation. The, uh, for those on Facebook, please share. If you're on YouTube, subscribe and share. Thank you for helping me with that. And before we get started, let's pray. We love you, Lord. We praise you. You're a mighty God. I'm asking for your help, Lord, to teach what you want me to teach that will help everyone out there, Lord. I'm yours, Lord. I've given myself to you. I'm asking for your help, your anointing. In your name, Jesus, amen. We are going to talk about nine rules of interpretation to rightly divide the word of truth. What's important here is, uh, let's take a look at a scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. And of course, perfect, uh, we can't be perfect like him, God, but we are trained, we become mature, we become complete. That's the meaning of perfection in the Bible for us. We've got, we've got to strive for perfection, but we've got to be trained. We've got to go through a process to get there. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, if it's for doctrine, reproof, and correction, that means that it has to be correct. And so the Word of God is very, very important, and, and every word of it, as you're going to see, uh, has to, well, is there to help us. The Bible is God's Word and is complete in itself. It was written in perfect harmony and unity by 40 writers over a period of 1,500 years, yet there are no errors or contradictions in it. 40 writers over a period of 1,500 years, perfect harmony, perfect unity, no contradictions. Uh, that's a miracle in itself. Or it tells us that God had to write this for it to be put together so perfectly. And I'll say no errors or contradictions. I, I need to put this <laughs> little thought in your mind here. This only applies to the King James Bible because I have found errors and contradictions in versions. Importance, the Bible gives the plan of God for the salvation of man. This plan is not hidden. It is easily understood by anyone seeking him. We are seeking the Bible's, God's interpretation. We're looking at how does God want us to interpret this. Why do we need rules for interpretation? Today in our world, we have over 41,000 plus Christian religious denominations. Each one was established and developed by a private or personal interpretation, which means there are 41,000 different interpretations, which is correct. By using the Bible's rules to interpret itself, we can see which of the denominations are truly standing on the Word of God, not adding anything to it or taking anything from it. I'm going to have a lot of writing in these slides because I wanted this to be something that if you wanted to further explore it or to dig deeper into it, you could come back to these slides, put it on pause, and, and even take pictures of it if you want. Uh, this is a very important lesson here. Rule one, pray before reading the Word. We need the Spirit of God to enlighten our minds and hearts to see what He wants to see rather than our desires and intents. It is, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's not my kingdom, my will, or my way. Correct prayer should, be, should begin with repentance. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. that they just, prayers communication or prayers uh, petition before God, but correct prayer should start with repentance. We need to die out to ourselves. Uh, Jesus, not ourselves, should be on the throne of our hearts. This is very, very important because people don't realize that, that if you have sin on your soul, uh, 
you can actually block your access to God. <laughs> I'll, I'll say this too. Why did uh, John the Baptist, why was he the first one to show up in the Gospels? What was his message? Repent, repent, repent for the, the, the Messiah is at hand. It tells us something right there. Repentance prepares us to come into his presence. John was the personification of repentance. He was able to come in contact with the personification of righteousness at the Jordan River where he baptized him. Rule 2, 2 Peter 1.21. Knowing this first, and no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The word of God did not come by the will of man, but by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. God is actually the writer of it. He moved through men over this 1,500 year period to get the word of God, his word, written. Man did not write it. Therefore, no man, religion, or church can have a private interpretation of scripture. No prophecy of scripture should be interpreted by its own thought. God never finishes all he wishes to say in just one place or passage. All scripture must be compared to other scriptures before and after it, and those that discuss the same issues to get its true objective meaning. Each step of God's plan of salvation was commanded in consideration of steps already taken. Progressive revelation. When we look at the plan of salvation, it will start out, believe, then repent, be baptized in Jesus' name, receive the Holy Ghost with evidence, speaking in tongues. And then that's where you actually begin a process of becoming more like him, being conformed into his image. It's uh, a process. The plan of God leads step by step from simple faith to full salvation and obedience to God's word. Error results from taking scripture out of context or using one scripture as a doctrine. One scripture as a doctrine. There's a lot of churches that do that. If you are studying baptism, look up all the scriptures that relate to baptism. The following is an example of an erroneous doctrine that can be made by taking three scriptures out of context and coupling to, together. Okay, so we're going to see a, a doctrine built through taking three random scriptures and putting them together. Judas went out and hanged himself. Go and do thou likewise, that thou doest do quickly. Many times a scripture may seem to contradict another scripture. If so, there is always a third scripture that will explain the differences between the two. That's very important. And uh, this says this thing and this says something else. I've, uh, but there'll be another scripture. Keep searching. There'll be another one that they'll balance it out that will define it. That will help you to understand it. Rule four. And Jesus answered him saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Every word in the Bible was important, particularly the gospel, the door to salvation given to us. Jeremiah 16, 2 declares, do not diminish a word. Jesus says, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law to all be fulfilled. In Matthew 5, 18, jot refers to yod, the smallest letter of the Hebrew el alphabet, and tittle refers to a small stroke of the pen that distinguishes certain Hebrew letters from others. Every word, every jot, every tittle is important in the Bible. We've got to make sure we're reading the correct book. Creation, Noah's Ark, the tabernacles and temples, and the plan of salvation show that God is a God of detail. <laughs> Look at our great creation. Uh, you go up to the highest mountain and you're going to find flowers up on the top of the mountain. I mean, the detail that God has put everything. Go to the bottom of an ocean and you're amazed by what you find down there. Uh, Noah's Ark, everything had to be done exactly as God told Noah to build it. The tabernacles and temples, everything had to be done exactly as God told them to do it. Or 
He would have never, his presence would have never been in them. God put every word in the Bible for a purpose. Rule five. This is the third time I'm coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. The gospel is established by using more than one witness for verification and clarification. A good example of the commandment to be, a good example is a commandment to baptize. Many churches use one scripture to baptize, Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. The name is never used, only the titles by these churches. In the book of Acts, we see four instances demonstrating the apostles baptizing in the name of Jesus in obedience to the commandment. The two witnesses used to establish this doctrine of baptism were Peter in Acts 2, 38, 8, 12 through 16, and 10, 43 to 48, and Paul in Acts 19, 1 to 6. In Galatians, both Peter and Paul met to compare notes on their preaching of the gospel. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those that obey his plan of salvation must die to self, repent. They must be buried, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and receive the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues. Being in agreement, Paul wrote, uh, both of them came together, compared notes, and wrote, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. That's strong. The doctrine of baptizing in the title of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost originated in 325 AD at the Nicene Council. It does not come from the Bible because no one in the Bible was baptized using titles. Constantine, the pagan emperor of Rome, assisted the Catholic Church to establish the Trinity doctrine to help him bring to his empire, uh, to help him bring peace to his empire due to the religious factions arguing with each other over doctrine. Constantine stopped the persecution of Christians to gain power. He supported the church, but was a dishonest leader who gave his foremost allegiance to the sun god. The Trinity doctrine of the Catholic Church states there's only one God, but in this one God there are three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Three separate persons. Three separate entities. Totally incorrect. That's not what the Bible says. Rule six. The Bible is literal in its historical setting. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What does gates mean? It refers to an outer gate of the city, and the inner gate it gave entrance to the homes of the people living within the city. The main city had walls around it, but then there was another area that had walls around it attached to the bigger area. And right through the center of that area, there was a gate here and a gate here, this is where all the business uh, men gathered. This is where the important people gathered. Between the gates, all the commerce took place. It is where the politicians of the city gathered our business, gathered out business. The gates of hell refer to the top demonic angels of hell, generals, devising the downfall of the church. They will not prevail in carrying out their plan to destroy the church, Jesus' name, or the plan of salvation. Rule seven, avoid improper spiritualizing of scripture. All types, shadows, and symbols that are used are fulfilled and revealed in the Bible. How be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual, that, uh, the natural, then the spiritual. Look at this, it says, first the literal interpretation and then the spiritual interpretation. We must first read the text and understand the natural interpretation of the word. For example, water is water, air is air, and land is land. I've talked to so many people and they got different words. It says water and they got an, a, a different interpretation of it. 
Uh, then we seek the spiritual meaning. If the natural use of the word makes no literal sense, then it must be interpreted as having symbolic sense, where we look elsewhere in the Bible to find out what the symbols mean. This meta method of interpreting scripture protects against multiple subjective interpretations. If the sense of scripture makes common sense, then seek no other sense, or you may fall into nonsense. Numeric principles, numeric principles rules. The symbolic significance of a number aided in the interpretation of a verse. Uh, the first mention of a number in scripture generally conveys its spiritual meaning. Spiritual, spiritual significance can be seen by comparing other scriptures using the same number and noting commonalities. Number 1 through 13 are the basic numbers having spiritual significance. Multiples of these numbers generally carry the same meaning, only intensifying the truth symbolized by them. In the tabernacle, there was one candlestick, and there was one table of shoe bread. In the temple, there was ten candlesticks, and there was ten tables of shoe bread. So <coughs> the meanings intensified. Well, the candlestick means witnessing and giving. And uh, if we're all tabernacles trying to become temples, it means we're going to be doing a lot more giving and witnessing in these last days. The table of shoe bread is reading and obeying the Bible. And that's telling us in the last days we're going to be doing a lot more reading and a lot more obeying of the Bible because we're getting ready for the end. Do not go beyond the boundaries of Scripture for an interpretation. Note, there is a fine line between Bible, numeric, and the danger of nu numerology, the worship and idolatrous use of numbers. You have to be careful with numbers. In all cases, using numbers, types, shadows, and symbols, let the Bible interpret itself to provide the correct meaning. Rule eight, know who is speaking and the circumstances surrounding what is being said. One who just opens the Bible and starts reading without knowing who is speaking or what circumstances exist may be in for some startling discoveries. In the Bible, we have the word of God and the words of man and even the words of Satan. Not knowing who is speaking could cause us to fall into error, study to show thyself approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. Some say the King James Bible is in error because it mentions Easter. In Acts 12, 4, King Herod, who did not care about the Passover, was, was speaking. He was concerned about the Easter festival that happened at the same time as uh, it was a pagan holiday, holiday. We call Easter Easter today, but actually that was a pagan holiday that uh, Herod was talking about and that was, they had that festival to his sun god worship. Rule nine, it is extremely important for each of us to receive the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, for the privilege and opportunity be led into the fullness of truth. When he, the spirit of truth, Jesus, is come, he will guide you into all truth. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I said unto you. Many today are radically against speaking in tongues, and some say it is of the devil. Often church people say, God did not give me that gift. The gift, Greek, Doria, of the Holy Ghost, is evidenced by the birth cry of speaking in tongues, that all whosoever will must receive. Spiritual gifts, Greek, charisma, referenced in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, are given to those who already have been born of the Spirit and experienced the rebirth. Now everyone re not, not everyone receives these gifts. Be careful, Romans 8, 9 says, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That's a scary scripture. I remember the first time I read that, and I had not received the Holy Ghost. It gave me a little bit of a, a, a desire, or a, a passionate desire to 
have the Holy Ghost, to receive God within me. Many religions tell their people that John 3.16 says, if you believe on Jesus Christ, you're automatically filled with the Holy Spirit. But they do not tell them what believe means, which you must understand to receive the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul in Romans 1.5 and 1626 emphasizes that the obedience of faith is required in God's plan of salvation. Hebrews 5.9 says, And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. That's a powerful scripture. He became the author of salvation unto all them that obey him. Reading further, the Bible tells us, once we believe to repent, be baptized in Jesus' name, and then receive the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. If we read further, we're going to see that there's more to do. On the day of Pentecost, Peter preached, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Notice he doesn't mention believing, because he understood that yielding to baptism was believing. The people want to be baptized? Well, they believe what God says. You've got to be baptized. It was obedience to the faith, and baptism was necessary. The evidence of receiving the Holy Ghost is speaking in tongues. There are 25 scriptures in the New Testament that discuss speaking in tongues. The verse says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. These signs... Speaking in tongues will follow them that believe. If you believe, you will be speaking in tongues. They shall speak with new tongues. Mark 16, 17. The last says, forbid not to speak with tongues. Now, we're going to get into uh, the importance of the King James Bible. And uh, basically, I'm going to be starting that in our next lesson. But let me just talk a little bit about it here. That... Uh, <coughs> When I first came to God, it was back in 1971, I was uh, uh, at the University of Iowa, I was studying evolution, I was going to become an evolutionist. And as I uh, was researching through the different molecules in the animal kingdom and the plant king kingdom, evolution never worked. I had one of the greatest scientists <laughs> I know at the university there one time stop me, he says, Roger, Evolution is just a theory. I still must know that can't be correct. That can't. And I dug even deeper, but ended up time and time again with uh, failure in my search. One night, I finally dropped to my knees, the sofa, and someone had told me one time that the greatest thing that you can say to God is, I love you. So I said, I love you. I love you. I love you. And all of a sudden, I felt like God wrapped his arms around me. I felt a, a beautiful feeling. And I remember starting to weep. And, and I just, it, was, it was just an unbelievable feeling. And then all of a sudden, he spoke to me. And he says, you've tried every other book. Now, why don't you try the Bible? God told me I needed to read the Bible. Uh, I did get into the Bible. And somehow, I swayed to the right or left. I didn't. I, uh, trying to finish up my, uh, how do I say, my studies. Uh, I had been drafted my senior year, and I wasn't going to get to finish my college. I was trying to get as much as I could before I had to head off to boot camp. And, of course, instead of the Army, I joined the Air Force. I was at Lackland Air Force Base. And, again, I said to myself, I started praying. I said, if you're the God of the universe, I want you to show me that you're real. And when you do that, I want you to show me how I can serve you. I got to England Air Force Base, my first assignment, and I met a Paul and Don Riga, who were at a uh, coffee house that I was walking through. They had a sign, Paul and Don are going to talk about their salvation from drugs. That word salvation just came out at me. I don't usually walk into stuff like that, but I went in there. And before it was over, I kind of lost contact of everything else because Paul was saying, you've got to read the Bible. You've got to read the Bible. You've got to read the Bible. And I realized that that one, this man, Paul, speaking to me, but God was speaking again through him to me to tell me I had to get into the Bible. <clears throat> Before when I read the Bible, I just didn't seem to be getting anywhere. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Not the 
uh, easiest reading in the world. But this time, I just started picking up a Bible and I started reading. I went back to my barracks and everything, I switched around and wherever I read, I read something that had meaning to me that, that uh, God was showing me the way. Uh, I ended up, uh, this is December 1971, I ended up coming to the church that I'm in now, the POA church in Alexandria, uh, Louisiana. It wasn't called POA at the time, but uh, I was baptized January 1st, 1972 and received the Holy Ghost a few days later. Charlie Cherrier in that church befriended me and gave me a King James Bible. And my pastor, G.A. Mangan, also said how important this King James Bible was. At the time I came in, there was a Bible out there that was called Light for Living. And it's easy English. And, and people started buying that time <coughs> all over the church. But I had got a King James Bible, and that's what I used. I did a lot of reading, too, because when I started reading the Bible, I wanted to make sure that what I was in was correct, that uh, was real, that uh, I had left a church, and tradition was hanging on to me. I had to make sure that I made a right move, a good move. And of course, about 10 years later, a lot of things started showing up in different magazines, uh, Christianity Today, uh, you see it on the news, but it, it was saying that the worst Bible that was ever written was the book, Light for Living. And I say, why? It says, one man interpreted the Bible in his own ideas and words of what he thought it meant. His name was Kenneth Taylor, and after he wrote the Bible and made a lot of money, <coughs> he lost his voice. And he never regained his voice. He died, it might have been five, six years ago, but uh, he never regained his voice. You don't add anything to the Word of God. You don't take anything away. He, he was on dangerous ground. We, we need to understand the importance of the King James Bible. Two main reasons is every one of these versions out there, it's all about money, making money. Second of all, in these last days, there's a one world government coming into being. And uh, they have to, first of all, dumb down the King James Bible. But second of all, they're looking for a Bible that will not offend anybody. The NIV came along, new international uh, international, they thought they would be this one world government uh, religion Bible, but uh, they didn't make it. <laughs> the Bible says we don't add, we don't take away. Next Bible lesson we get into, we're going to be talking about the King James Bible. In your name, Jesus, thank you for being with us, helping us. We love you. We praise you. Help us, Lord, to get into your word as never before. Teach us, guide us, show us the way. In your name, amen.